You're listening to The Unsafe Bible with Pastor Ken Brown. We get a view of how God can go in and out of our timeline and how Jesus did that. And sometimes I wonder whether or not he had a great joy being able to surprise them. Hi, guys. They got up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem. So these are the two folks who had been walking with Jesus. They get a sermon from Jesus, and then he disappears. They turn around, and they walk back to Jerusalem to talk to the disciples. And they found gathered together the eleven and those who were with them, saying, The Lord has really risen and has appeared to Simon. We live in a physical world with its four known space-time dimensions of length, width, height, and time. However, God dwells in the spirit realm beyond the perception of our physical senses. Today, Pastor Ken will be explaining how since God is outside of time, he knows the beginning to the end and knows your past, present, and future. God is not shocked when you sin. He already knows. He saved you knowing your failings. He just wants you to confess, repent, and get back up. Well, let's join Pastor Ken in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 8, as he begins his message, Visions of the Temple. We're going to find out that, uh, and this is really the first vision that Ezekiel has, and he's going to get a vision of the temple. Now, whether or not it's truly a vision or not, we're going to dig into that a little bit, because there are some people who think he was actually transported back to Jerusalem, some that he was taken in the spirit. It doesn't say. I mean, it it kind of looks like either way, but he's seeing some things that only God would know and only God would see. So we'll talk a little bit about that. But he's going to find out what's really going on back in Jerusalem. Uh, Why is Jerusalem going to be judged by God? Why is everybody involved in this? He was a priest, but he does not know what is going on in the the, uh, temple. So he's going to find out a a little bit about that. We've seen his sermons, we've gone through four of them, and now we're done with the sermons for a while. This is a vision. God is the God of space and time. And we're going to see that later in the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel actually gets transported through time. I think he physically was moved from one period of time to another period of time and actually is giving us an eyewitness account of things. I believe that what he's going to talk about here in chapter 8 is an eyewitness account. God is letting him see what's actually going on in the temple. He's not, he's not being given somebody else's vision. He's actually seeing it, and, and we'll see that he actually names names and recognizes some of the people that he's seeing. Um, why do I say that God's the God of time and that this is not new to him? In Luke 24, 33 to 40, we get a view of how God can go in and out of our timeline. And how Jesus did that. And sometimes I wonder whether or not he had a great joy being able to surprise them. Hi guys. They got up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem. So these are the two folks who had been walking with Jesus. They get a sermon from Jesus and then he disappears. They turn around and they walk back to Jerusalem to talk to the disciples. And they found gathered together the eleven and those who were with them saying, The Lord has really risen and has appeared to Simon. They began to relate their experiences on the road and how he was recognized by them in the breaking of the bread. While they were telling these things, he himself stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought that they were seeing a spirit. I'd be startled and frightened too. The door is locked, the windows are closed, and all of a sudden Jesus is standing in there. And remember, these two guys left him uh, a day's walk away, 15 miles down the road. They've walked all the way back, and Jesus is there. Uh, And he says, Why are you troubled? Why do doubts arise in your heart? I always love that. Why are you troubled? Well, Lord, because you just walked through a wall uh, and you just showed up in front of me. That's why I'm troubled. But God is in control of physical space. He's in control of time. And it's obvious that in his risen, resurrected body, Jesus doesn't operate in just three dimensions like we do. He may be operating in other dimensions that existed that we might have been able to operate in if Adam had not sinned. Don't know. Don't know for sure. Uh, There's some scientists who believe that to create the universe, God would have to operate in at least 11 dimensions. And they do that using a thing called string theory. But there's also a a guy by the name of Maimonides, who is a rabbi who operated in the Middle Ages, and he determined the same thing, studying the book of Genesis. So maybe there's more than just what we see here, in that 
God's not, Jesus is not passing through a wall. He's just operating from another dimension. Don't know that for sure. But I love what he says. See my hands and my feet. It's I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you have. Or, and you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. What we see is that Jesus operated and demonstrated multidimensionality in his resurrected, glorified body. He's able to move rapidly across distances and appears to be part of that. Um, and now we see that Ezekiel probably is going to get to experience some of that same rapid time shift, rapid travel, where he's in one minute in his living room, and in the next minute he's in the temple. I don't understand that, but if God, but God obviously can do that, and we saw it, we saw it demonstrated with Jesus in uh, throughout the New Testament. Jesus operated in that, and Ezekiel is going to now see a little bit of that, and uh, God's going to flex and move a little bit of time and a little bit of space to get Ezekiel where he needs to be to see this. So, starting in verse two of chapter eight, then I looked, and behold, a likeness as the appearance of a man. From his loins and downward there is an appearance of fire, and from his loins and upward the appearance of brightness, like the appearance of glowing metal. He stretched out the form of a hand and caught me by a lock of my head, and the Spirit lifted me up between heaven and earth and brought me in the visions of God to Jerusalem, to the entrance of the north gate of the inner court, where the seat of the idol of jealousy, which provokes to jealousy, was located. And behold... The glory of the Lord, the glory of the God of Israel was there like the appearance of which I saw in the plain. Who Ezekiel sees is exactly the same person that he saw back in chapter 1. He's giving the same description pretty much that we saw in chapter 1, verse 26 and 27, um, where he says, Now above the expanse that was over their heads there was something resembling a throne, like lapis lazuli in appearance, and on that which resembled a throne, high up was a figure with the appearance of a man. I noticed from the appearance of his loins and upward, something like glowing metal that looked like fire all around him, and from the appearance of his loins downward, something like fire, and there's a radiance around him. Who is Ezekiel seeing? I believe he's seeing probably the pre-incarnate Christ. Anytime that there is an appearance of God in a, and people see him, they're, they're usually seeing Jesus Christ. They're usually seeing him prior to him being born as a, uh, the child of a virgin and, and raised for 30 years and then dying and resurrecting from the dead. Uh, Jesus is the one in the burning bush. Jesus is the one that Abraham talked with. And usually it says the angel of the Lord or, or words such as that. And, and here it could be the same thing. Uh, it's probably Jesus that, that is involved in this. Uh, we see the same kind of terms talking about Jesus. And John uses it in Revelation chapter 1. Uh, starting in verse 12, then I turned to see the voice that was speaking with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. In the middle of the lampstands, I saw one like a son of man, clothed in a robe to the feet and girded across his chest with a golden sash. His head and his, fa and his hair were white, like white wool, like snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, which has been made to glow in a furnace and his voice was like the sound of many waters. We're, se we're seeing kind of a repeat of the same description that we saw in Ezekiel chapter 1, and now that we see in Ezekiel chapter 8. So imagine this. Ezekiel is here basking by the mighty growth of trees. There aren't any. Uh, by the river Chebar, which is just a giant canal uh, south of Babylon, between ba uh, Babylon and the Kuwait border, except it wasn't Kuwait at that time. So somewhere along that, he's got his house, and he's busy doing his thing uh, where he's every day staring at a brick. And all of a sudden, he gets this vision. This individual shows up. He sees it, but all of the elders of Israel who are with him don't see this. They don't see it at all. But God shows up in front of him and reaches down and grabs him by the hair. And immediately, he goes from Nippur which is located uh, near the mouth of the Euphrates River over on the Persian Gulf. And he's in Jerusalem, a little over 1,100 miles away. And for him to move that distance that fast, only God can do that. Because for him, it would have taken the better part of probably six months of travel to go from one place to the other, traveling every day. 
But he did it faster than we can do it today. I mean, unless you're doing it via television uh, or satellite communications. So he goes from that place at the Chibar River to here. This is where he's at suddenly. He's on the north end of this complex where you see the, the wall right here um, where the trees are. That's where he's at. He's on that north end. Um, literally, we're uh, just in front of the, where it says uh, Golden Gate, which wasn't built at that time, but he's right in that general area. He's, he's all of a sudden in Jerusalem at the north end looking, uh, looking at the temple. And uh, again, looking at it from the north, what he would have seen would be more like this. This is actually a model uh, of the north end of the temple. And he's actually there at the bottom of that, that wall is where he's at. So in a moment of time, Ezekiel finds himself moving from his bedroom, his living room actually, with all these folks sitting there and staring at him like they've done for the last year. And now he's at the altar gate on the north end of the temple complex, just like that. Back into the text here, verse 5, we get back to what God's going to be showing him. So he said to me, son of man, raise your eyes now toward the north. So he's there looking at that gate, that's where all this is going on, and he raises his eyes and he looks to the north. So I raised my eyes toward the north, and behold, to the north of the altar gate was this idol of jealousy at the entrance. And he said to me, son of man, do you see what they're doing? The great abominations which the house of Israel are committing here, so that I would be far from my sanctuary. But yet you'll see still greater abominations. What is an idol of jealousy? What is he talking about that's right there where all the sacrifice for sin is supposed to be taking place? In Jeremiah 7, verse 30, Jeremiah tells us a little bit about what's there. Remember, Jeremiah, while Ezekiel is doing his ministry in uh, Babylon, uh, da Daniel is in the court ha courtroom of, of Babylon working with uh, King Nebuchadnezzar. Jeremiah is back in Jerusalem, and he's still trying to convince the king, don't rebel, don't rebel. And they're so pleased with his ministry, they've thrown him, thrown him into a, a, an open well. Uh, but in chapter 7 of verse 30, he talks about what's going on in the temple. The sons of Judah have done that which is evil in my sight, declares the Lord. They have set their detestable things in the house, which is called by my name, to defile it. There was a guy who actually did that. And we remember him by the name of Manasseh. In 2 Kings chapter 21, verses 3 to 7, here's what he did. He rebuilt the high places which Hezekiah, his father, had destroyed. So in other words, when we talked about all of the altars and all that in the high places, Manasseh rebuilt them. He erected altars for Baal and made an Asherah, as Ahab, king of Israel, had done, and worshipped all the host of heaven and served them. He built altars in the house of the Lord. Now, when you read that, that means he built altars and idols in the temple. That's the house of the Lord. That's where he's building these. He's putting them in the courtyards. He's putting them in the gate areas. That's what he's doing. He built altars for all the host of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord, the court in the north and the court in the south. He had that going on. So that if you were going to sacrifice, you'd have to go by all these pagan altars to be able to sacrifice to the Lord. He made his son pass through the fire. That's a way of saying that he practiced human sacrifice. Uh, he practiced witchcraft and used divination and dealt with mediums and spiritists. He did much evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking him to anger. Then he set the carved image of Asherah that he, had been ma that he had made in the house of which the Lord said to David and his son, in this house and in Jerusalem, which I've chosen from all the tribes of Israel, I'll put my name forever. So he actually put an altar in the holy place in the temple. Not a good thing to do. If it's the Asherah referred to in 2 Kings 21, if that's what that this is actually being talked to here, then it most likely is a large phallic symbol. Great thing to have right where all the sacrifice for sin is taking place. Uh, or maybe it was a carved image of Ashtoreth, who is the female fertility goddess. Uh, if so, it's reflected, uh, reflecting Canaanite idolatry. Or some people think it might have been a temple guardian like a sphinx, which would have been Babylonian uh, idolatry, Ir irregardless. Um, so there's this idol right there at the gate, that north gate that we showed, where you would go in and you would bring your animal and they would bring it out and kill the animal. There's an idol there. 
uh, and it's an Asherah. So if it's an Asherah, an Asherah is the consort of El, who is the highest god in Canaanite uh, religion. And she's the mother of 70 lesser gods, including Baal, one whose appellations was the son of Asherah, Binturth. In the Old Testament, this is also identified usually with Astarte and worshipped alongside Baal, who's the storm god. Whatever it is, okay? I could go into all of the different stuff as to how they, who's who and so forth in terms of the pantheon of Canaanite idolatry. I don't think it's necessary. But it wasn't supposed to be there. You're not supposed to be seeing an idol in the temple where you sacrifice. It wasn't supposed to be there. Also there, identified in verse 4, uh, was the glory of God. So we see here's the idol, and as he and it says in verse 4, uh, and behold the glory of the God of Israel was there too. So he's saying here's the idol, and as I look to the north I also see the same throne that I saw in chapter 1. So here's the throne of God, and here's this idol, and God can't approach because of what that idol represents. Uh, it represents demons, it represents evil, it represents fallen angels who are actually usurping God and and convincing Israel that they need to be worshipped rather than the true God. It's not supposed to be there. Uh, The fact that the idol was there in God's views was an abomination, but God says, oh, it gets worse. This is just the beginning. He says they're doing great abominations. Now, I think a great abomination is having an idol where you sacrifice for sin. And he's saying, oh no, this is worse. There's, there's worse stuff than that going on. Uh, and, and he says what this stuff that's worse is, it's so bad it will drive God away from the temple. And we're going to actually see as we go through these visions, we'll actually see the, the glory of God depart from the temple. So what is it that God considers to be an abomination? So there's a list, believe it or not, of abominations. These are, these are the things that God considers for Israel to be abominations. And I've got the reference there for the scripture where you can find that. Unclean food is an abomination according to God. Idols is an abomination. Pagan spiritists. Now remember, Manasseh is doing all of this, and he introduced all this to the temple. That's an abomination. Burning children to Molech. Manasseh did that too. Uh, Canaanite all the idolatry, yep, uh, an abomination. Sacrificing blemished animals. In other words, instead of bringing the best to God, uh, you've got four bulls, and one of them has a, uh, a limp in, in, in its leg and is missing a horn. You sacrifice that one instead of the good bull. That's a blemished animal, and that's, not, that's a, it's an abomination. Sacrificing to idols, that's an abomination. According to the Scriptures... Um, Remarrying a woman who you've previously divorced. That's an abomination according to the scripture. Women wearing men's clothes. That's actually an abomination in the scriptures. And it's considered a possible type of Canaanite worship as well. Uh, Money from cultic prostitution um, was an abomination. And the thing that's really funny, you read that and you realize that there is a woman who was a prostitute working in the, te- in the Canaanite temple uh, in a place called Jericho. She decided that she wanted to side with Israel. Her name's Rahab, and she's mentioned in the genealogy of Jesus Christ because God saved her. She turned from that sin. Uh, other things that were considered an abomination, homosexuality, which again is part of Canaanite worship, uh, the use of false weights. Now that's not saying that you're using false weights when you're weightlifting or anything like that. That means if you're weighing, uh, in, weighing grain and you're buying a pound of grain, they use false weights and, and they're actually selling you 11 ounces instead of 16. But it looks like it's 16. Uh, food laws that are violated, those are also considered an abomination. There's a lot of things that God considered to be an abomination. But the glory of God's still there. Even in, in the fact of all the things that Manasseh did, And all the evil that he did, the glory of God's there. But notice that Ezekiel said it's like when he saw the glory of God in chapter 1. In chapter 1, the the glory of God, the, the 
throne room was in travel mode and came to him. What he's saying is when he looks up and he sees the idol and he sees the glory of God, the glory of God is once again in travel mode. It looks just like it did when he saw it in chapter 1. It's ready to leave. It's ready to move. Uh, and And he's seen that before. So over time, and with a giant push from one king, the people who were supposed to be shepherds of the people, the folks in the temple, had actually become false. They'd added to the worship in the temple, and they were worshiping things of man, and they were worshiping demons. They had added or subtracted from what was actually the worship of God. Do we see things like that corporately in the church today, where people aren't worshiping God, but they're worshiping other things, or they're talking about other things? I mean, there's whole denominations right now that never even open up a Bible in a Bible study. They say they're doing a Bible study, but they don't teach from the Bible. They're teaching from philosophy or uh, whatever. Uh, we see it all over the place today, and it's really sad. Uh, in Second Peter chapter 2, verses 1 to 3, Peter tells us that one of the signs of the end of the age is very easy to see. And he compares it to what's going on here with the false prophets that Ezekiel is dealing with in chapter 8. But false prophets also arose among the people. And he's pointing back to Ezekiel 8 and back to this time period. Just as there will also be false teachers among you who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. And yes, we do have folks today who say they are Bible teachers and they deny that Jesus Christ is God. And as you've heard Pastor Dan say, that we can agree on a lot of things and disagree on a lot of things, but Jesus Christ as God is, that's it. You know, that's, we're not going to, there's no fellowship there if somebody does not believe he is God, because that's the base, Jesus is God, period. But there are whole groups that talk about that now and teach it. Uh, most of them are dead Germans, but they, they, that's kind of how it, how it works. Uh, there's destructive heresies being taught as being scriptural, there's a, there's a discussion right now that's going on amongst a certain movement within the church corporately where they're denying that hell even exists. Yet Jesus talked more about it than he did heaven. It's a real place. But they're trying to say, oh no, at the end everybody, everybody gets saved. That's not what the Bible teaches. It doesn't teach that at all. Uh, these are just a couple of the things. and They're destructive because it drives people into thinking that they don't have to give their life to Jesus Christ, and as a result of the false teaching, they don't give their life to the Lord, and and, and that can have eternal consequences. Which is why Peter says, swift destruction, it's destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. Many will follow their sensuality, and because of them, the way of the truth will be maligned. That's why certain types of churches that teach things other than God's Word can have 10, 20, 30,000 people attending them. All you have to do is make sure you don't mention God's Word. And they don't. I'm not going to mention what the names of any of those churches are, but anyway. Uh, Many will follow their sensuality, and because of them the way of the truth will be maligned, and in their greed they'll exploit you with false words. Their judgment from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. That's a sign of the end of the age. Amongst the youngest generation of Americans, millennials, people who are aged uh, 18 to 31, and this is from a, a recent book called Good Faith. It's by the Barna Group. Fewer than half believe that the Bible is authoritative. They no longer believe, people who say they're born again, less than half of the young folks believe that this is an authoritative book. so glad you tuned into today's edition of the unsafe bible with pastor ken for more information about this ministry and what we believe you can find all you need to know at the unsafe want to hear more messages from ezekiel we've got that too just look under the media tab again our website is the unsafe as you've been listening to this teaching in ezekiel what are some of the things that come to mind Do you struggle with unresolved sins in your life? Have you found yourself wondering why your life isn't going as planned? Can you imagine what it would be like to be exiled from paradise and to be told it was all your fault? That's the truth that Ezekiel had to deliver to the Jews from Babylon. It took 70 years 
but they finally accepted their sin as their own and returned in faith to God. Where are you on that journey? No matter what the circumstances are, you must seek God in all things to ensure a singular focus on the one true God. We want you to find strength in your faith. And if you need help or have questions, you can contact us directly at theunsafebible.com. Just click on the Connect tab and the Connect card. Fill it out and we'll get in touch with you. If you're in the Jupiter, Florida area, we want to invite you to our next worship service. Directions can be found on the About tab by clicking the word Contact. We hope to see you soon. Well, that's all the time we have for today. But we want to invite you back again next for more encouraging and uplifting messages by Pastor Ken right here on The Unsafe Bible.